So uh, I was invited to make a reprise of the Nobel lecture, but I'd never actually written it down. It was done extemporaneously and I didn't think it was very good. So I didn't feel like doing a reprise. The uh, subject of it mainly was how in my early studies of auctions, I had been so motivated to try and unravel what in the world the Valrhesian equilibrium could possibly mean. What was Valra in you know, 19, or, uh, 1868, uh, which I'd read the book, uh, what in the world was he really talking about? And so that's why I got interested in auctions. And so the wonderful thing is that Paulo and Hari have been working on this uh, model of large auctions and invited me to be with them, even though they've done the technical work and I can't claim uh, having proved anything, which is pretty much true of my whole life that I, I've never succeeded in proving anything of substance. But, you know, I've always poked around, studied examples and uh, had ideas. So, um, so it's, it's a happy thing that I get to present these slides were originally prepared by Paolo for another talk. So they're a little technical and therefore, uh, particularly some of the things about the proof. So I think I should skip over for this general presentation. So there's some slides that uh, I didn't figure out how to hide. So they're still there, we'll go through them. So the idea is to study, uh, uh, the Valrhesian equilibrium is sort of a, a limit point of perfectly competitive economy. Uh, thinking of how it could be implemented or how to what extent it's approximated by the outcome of an auction with many participants. So when I say auctions, uh, the model is going to allow both double auctions and one-sided auctions. So I won't actually make that distinction except where it uh, comes up some places. Um, so uh, let me start with some motivation, some motivation that actually uh, influenced me 60 years ago when I started on uh, looking at the topic. So, um, so I give some here three quotes, which I actually uh, in, the, in the published lecture, I actually uh, cited these same ones. One was Hayek in 1945, emphasizing uh, markets and the price system as sort of like an information system because it's really reflecting the information of all the participants. And Hurwitz, who said, well, yeah, that's really true, but we must think of the information system in terms of its incentives and, and how it actually works as an operational system. And so uh, he posed it as a problem of mechanism design and something like a Nash equilibrium of, in such a mechanism. And then the other aspect, one that sort of rattles along in finance more than in, in mainstream economics is the so-called efficient market hypothesis of uh, Fama, Eugene Fama. And there's a so-called strong form of it. You know, he studies a lot in uh, all the people in that field study in terms of the publicly available information, historical information, and so on. Is that all getting represented in prices? But there's the so-called strong form, which involves the private information. And they talk about empirical evidence has been mixed. <laughs> Actually, I have this sense like, how could that be? If it's private information, how could they test it? It's like, it's unobservable to the uh, outside observer. So, but anyway, in, in Wikipedia, they described it as uh, not generally not supporting strong forms of the efficient market hypothesis, hypothesis. That is, there's not convincing evidence that private inf private, inf privately known information is being reflected in prices, which is quite the contrary, of course, of the rational expectations kind of view that's actually the dominant uh, aspect of the efficient market hypothesis. So what we're going to be looking at, we have a system in which there's uh, many buyers and sellers. We're just going to look at unit demand and supply. Each agent has private information. Um, they're going to, um, we're going to uh, restrict them to line a finite set of types of agents. That is a finite set, each one 
has a valuation and a probability distribution of signals. The, uh, the role of the private information in part is to reveal something about hidden, a hidden state variable. So this is a common value model. Uh, we're going to assume that the, there's private information is affiliated. In fact, it's, that it's conditionally independent given the, uh, the underlying state variable. But it's going to, it's a model then with inter interdependent valuations that all the participants information is potentially in, uh, revealing about the hidden state. And then we're going to use that to compare uh, an auction mechanism and the Valrasian mechanism at the limit and sort of ask the question is the outcome of a large auction uh, approximately that of a Valrasian uh, outcome. Remember, the thing that, that perplexed me 60 years ago was how in the world could they, uh, this idea that somehow uh, down from the heavens, you know, God provides the market uh, operator with this uh, price that will clear the market, and then people react to that prices, react to those prices. So then we had these other kind of uh, dynamic representations that they in Valra that there would be these constant attempts to find a market clearing until finally they got to one without any really convincing dynamics as, uh, that would have incentive effects that would be incentive compatible as to how they would get there. So the topics we address are the existence of these Volrazian rational expectations in uh, infinite economies, the existence of Nash equilibria for large but finite double auctions, and um, we're actually going to get that from the existence of the rational expectations equilibrium in a way, because you just look at a large auction as a per perturbation of the infinite uh, economy, you know, auction with infinite number of uh, traders. And then look at the question of the convergence of auction prices to Valrasian prices. And that's expressed in two forms. One is sort of a Upper, upper semi-continuity that, that converges to the rational expectations equilibrium. And the other one is to say that it's lower semi-continuity that given you've got a rational expectations equilibrium uh, is, uh, is that approximated by nearby finite uh, auctions. So uh, here's the, just a part of the literature. Of course, so much of the work in auctions deals with symmetric uh, bidders. And Milgram and Weber is sort of the definitive article about that. Uh, he and I had earlier articles in which we were studying a model of uh, which uh, so with symmetric bidders, which we were looking at a uh, large auction with a common value component and try and, and establish the conditions for the uh, equilibrium, clear, the equilibrium price in the auction. This is a one-sided auction converging to the um, fully revealing, uh, to, to a, a price that fully reveals the, the hidden state variable, one-dimensional state variable. And then there's a whole literature that falls along after that. Uh, and the thing about it is this point here at the bottom that I'm emphasizing about private values or they always assume private values are symmetric bidders. So with private values, we don't have this hidden state variable. With symmetric bidders, uh, then you're, you're building on the Milgram-Weber model. The Reddy and Samir um, is the next one here. And they emphasize the case with asymmetric bidders. And they were able, to establish existence um, using a finite uh, bit of grids, which is then uh, shrinks away to, so that it become in the limit like a continuum of uh, possible bids. And this actually is uh, a very important technical aspect because if you look at the, um, one way to think of it is uh, each bidder's sort of uh, first order condition depends upon his assessment of the derivative of other bidders' uh, inverse bidding function—that is, the type that would that would 
could uh, do better in that bid. Well, so um, this is sort of a regress of beliefs about beliefs. It shows up in the differential equations if you had a continuum of uh, bit space as a um, that always if you if uh, well they put we point out in the in the paper itself by the way which has not been put out yet as a working paper but will be shortly that you just get a regression of derivatives that you, wherever derivative you think you have the best response to that will have will have one less to, uh, degree of differentiation. So this becomes, this problem was overcome by assuming a finite uh, set of possible bids, line in a grid, which then becomes increasingly finer and you avoid this problem. And it's sort of a, it's almost a technical trick, but it really has this uh, uh, underlying conceptual aspect. And then Rennie and Perry uh, also doing that with double auctions, um, and they, um, they're assuming that symmetric agents, that is the buyers and the sellers are still of the same type. Some want to, some are endowed and can sell and some want to buy, but they are still symmetric in, as a type in terms of valuations and probability distributions. So what we're, the main contribution of this paper from that point of view is just to extend Rennie and Perry's article to the case with a, a finite set of types of uh, agents. So it's we have asymmetry, but within each type, uh, we're going to have symmetry. So there's a finite set of those, even though we'll be looking at the limit with many bidders. So the setup is that buyers and sellers have unit supply. The buyers are going to always be strategic, but we allow that the sellers need not be. So an auction is a, a one-sided auction is when the sellers are passive. The set of strategic agents is uh, I here. And we're going to assume we have M1 as the number of sellers. And this M0 is this, the residual is going to be the number of unserved agents. That is once you can't serve because they're in excess of the number of units uh, that a, the sellers are endowed with. And we have a one-dimensional hidden state, omega. Each agent observes a one-dimensional signal. And there's, you know, just technically there's a pr uh, prior over the, the hidden state and the signals with a positive density. The valuations, uh, depend upon both the, the state and the signal. And the assumption we're going to make is that, first of all, that the signals are conditionally independent and satisfy the monotone likelihood ratio property. So a higher signal is indicative of a higher state. Uh, and then we're going to assume that the valuation is strictly increasing in the signal, weakly increasing in the state. And uh, since so the signal here is not entirely inform uh, just information, it's actually payoff relevant. So this is not quite what one would like to have. You might because there can be information that's not payoff relevant. But this is the setup we're going to use. Uh, there are these models. There's some others, particularly uh, Song Zi Du and Hao Zhu Zhu. Uh, where they actually show this is this is necessary. You have to have that each person values his signal as with uh, as having some payoff relevance. Okay, so um, we're going to compare the economy and the auctions. And of course, the economy, as they say, nobody knows what the hell they had in mind. But in, in a finite economy, there somehow it's true that a price is posted. It's that is known to clear the market and then the agents buy or sell at that price. So we're not going to get into how that uh, price is found. The trader, if he uh, trades, of course, he just gets his value minus the price he paid and the seller gets the price minus uh, his value of uh, retaining it. I noticed there's a B in here. It's supposed to be a P. The seller gets the price P. So the game, uh, auction game. It's a double auction. And of course, it just has the standard rules 
that they agents observe their signals, they submit their bids, we line up the bids so that we're going to clear the market. And the only thing I'd point out is we're allowing an arbitrary rule for selecting uh, in, within the interval of clearing prices, uh, which one will be picked. It could be the highest, like a sort of like a first price auction or the lowest sort of like a second price auction. And uh, then uh, payoffs again, are they're based upon the clearing price in the this chosen in the auction. Okay, so just uh, just the standard formalities that a uh, pure strategy is uh, you know a measurable map from the signals. It's monotone if it's weakly increasing. It's um, the payoff to uh, bidder is. You notice there's a difference between his payoff. Well, difference between his payoff and the price. So this is the notation for the price and that uh, materializes in the auction. And the way this is written is wrong. I mean, sigma here should depend upon other people's signals. So you should think of it in terms of the expectation over all of what their bids will be. And then tau is the notation here for the probability of getting to trade. If he doesn't trade, the prop payoff is zero. So uh, and then we have a Nash equilibrium here. Uh, if, uh, of course, if this strategy is optimal. Um, the, um, now we're going to be studying the replicas. So of course we think of the standard way the economy is replicated, sort of a debris scarf replication of agents, uh, and similarly with an auction. So each of these are with the same sets of agents and signals and so on. So the agent set is just this, uh, countable set of agents, uh, the thing about it is that each, the agent's type I is fixed and then his, the index runs over which of the agents of that type we're talking about. And um, then there's an extension of the probability distribution over this space where the important thing is that it's, it's done as a countable set of agents. It's not a measure space of agents. It's not a, con, you know, a continuum. Uh, it's it's not of that sort of stuff. This is a, a genuine limit uh, to a countable set of agents. Um, so in the Valrhasian economy, that works differently. Uh, we're given a price map that maps states uh, a state, but it's uh, actually it's, we're going to have it. It's a, not a function of the signals. It's a function of the true state omega. No way in this representation. And uh, agents' valuations conditional on what they're, they're taking account of the information revealed by the price. That's the whole rational expectation idea is the price is somehow incorporating all the relevant information. In this case, it's taking it's saying, well, it's not, it's not incorporating the information in the signals, it's incorporating the information about the state that's in the price. So then we get the, uh, demand, you know, which is one or zero for a buyer to just he, he, he wants to buy if his valuation exceeds the price. Similarly for a seller, and we have a normalized excess demand then, which is this Z. That is, we're taking the limit as uh, the average one over n of the sum of their demands. Similarly for a double auction, that's for a double auction. We if the buyers are non-strategic, excuse me, if the sellers are non-strategic, we'd subtract that out. But the point is that the either way, by the strong law of large numbers, the excess demand is just going to be this number of unserved customers or you know participants, M naught, and minus these all these people that got uh, signals too low to participate. So, um, so this is the measure of those uh, in this uh, normalized system. So what we want is in equilibrium, excess demand should be zero, which is to say, just as we go back here, is to say that this is zero. So M naught's this, the ones that must be uh, go unserved, 
and the sum of the PIs is a measure of how many are uh, got signals so low that they're going to be unserved. Okay, so um, we say that the rational expectation equilibrium is uh, fully revealing if it's strictly increasing. And, and for this, make this non-degeneracy assumption. And the first part is saying that, excuse me, that there exists an interior point of the right kind. But um, that is, you, you can get signals in such a way that everybody winds up with the same valuation. And that's because the valuations are increasing and uh, the signal, and uh, by moving them all around, you can get that they, uh, you can get the right number to be unsatisfied, to be unserved. But uh, the other thing is that we don't have a situation in which all of the, uh, well, let's say, think of it as a, as a, as a double auction here, this set J1, this is just a number that's equal to num the number of sellers, number of objects actually to, to be traded. But all the people with those valuations, their, va their values, even at the worst, at the lowest state are greater than what they would be uh, uh, for the others uh, in the highest state. So that would say that, so there's no real trade possible. So we're getting rid of the, the impossibility of trade situation. So in that case, there exists a unique rational expectation equilibrium and it's fully revealing. So we get a price function that's a increasing function of the true state. It's fully revealing of the state. Therefore, people respond to it and you get a market clearing. So the technical aspect of this that's uh, rather interesting is the way uh, it's set up that they create this uh, complementarity problem. So you have the, the, here, the first condition in these set of equations. First one's saying, well, the market's got to clear. The second says it's a complementarity because these lambdas represent the uh, slack, slack variable in whether the, the agent uh, is going to buy or, or sell. The couple, they have to be complementarity. That is, his XI is going to be zero if the if there's slack, so he's not going to trade. Uh, well, excuse, well, yeah, if his. Okay. So we're looking at the, the way to interpret this is that these XIs now are cutoffs. They are the largest signal such that the agent wants to trade. So this is an, a complementarity system. It's not a linear complementarity system. It's nonlinear. Uh, but the thing is, once you have all of this, so I, let me emphasize again down here that this is for the uh, cutoff type, X, what is XI. So we have a rational expectation equilibrium in all of this in terms of the, the, the actual state, the actual realized signals, the bids they make and so on, if it solves that system because it has in it all of the optimality conditions for the agents. And so that's a way of characterizing the rational expectations equilibrium. And to get the properties like the existence and the monotonicity and all that is, to, is this proof that this is a non-empty connected one-dimensional manifold. So you to exploit these manifold properties. In particular, being a manifold in its construction, it projects one-to-one -one and onto the state variable and uh, both the state is rising along that uh, manifold and also the clearing price, which we could have called instead of B there, we could have called it, uh, you know, P because we think of it in terms of the price in the Volrasian system. Okay, so th this manifold properties are exploited uh, uh, in all of this uh, technology. But the thing is that the uh, rational expectation equilibrium need not be associated with monotone cutoff types. So uh, why is that important? Well, in an auction with, uh, in, uh, with you know, increasing uh, monotone stra bidding strategies, it has to be that they're, they pay, you're going to have to have that 
the bidders uh, trade if their signals high enough and the cutoff point should be increasing in the state. But that, we're, that doesn't have to happen. So, uh, I, excuse me. So here's this example. Uh, Paulo came up with this beautiful example. Very, this one's very simple, a little more complicated ones. But the point is that um, uh, first, just at the bottom line, it shows what the uh, Valrhesian price signal has to be as a function of the state. It's just a linear function of the state. We find the cutoff for type one, and uh, we find out what it is. It's increasing in the, in the state variable, but for the other type, it's decreasing. And how does this come about? Well, if you look up at the top uh, at the valuations, the bidder of type one has a valuation. He, he didn't even care about the state of the world, omega. He cares only about his signal. It's linearly increasing his signal, doesn't depend on omega. He doesn't care about the signal. The other guy really cares about the signal. He well, he cares equally about his signal and his, and the state. Okay. Well, look at their distributions. Uh, this first one, just forget the min max part. The thing is, this represents that the player one, type one that has doesn't care about the state variable, actually has good information about the state. Whereas player two's probability over here on the right, this is uh, has no information about the state. It's the same uniform distribution regardless of the state. So his signal is uninformative. So really, what we have is something like what we have in an a for this is an ordinary auction, but we've seen this in something like double auctions in Akerlof's lemons market. Because there you have, a think of it as a bargaining situation between a buyer and a seller. Well, the Akerlof situation, the lemons market is that the seller has really good information, uh, but doesn't really care about the quality for himself. I mean, because he's selling the car, he wants to get rid of it, he doesn't care about the quality, but he has good information about the quality of the car and the buyer uh, really cares about the quality of the car that he's going to get, but he has very poor information. So in Akerlof's situation, there's no trade possible in that two-sided market. Well, here, this is an ordinary auction, and you actually have the same phenomenon. You have that there's this adverse selection, and uh, it's represented here by the absence of monotone cutoffs. So we're going to say that the rational expectation equilibrium is totally monotone, both if it's an increasing function, the price is an increasing function of the state, but so are the cutoffs for, for the cutoff for each type. So from that, uh, we put together this, you can infer the state from the signals if you've got enough of them. And um, um, and so we have it a, a, an induced sort of a reduced form valuation V star here. This telling us uh, valuation based upon the inferred state from the signals, which is this Q star of X. And we'll say it satisfies uh, average crossing here. If it satisfies this inequality, it, you know, it's Jacobian has essentially like a dominant diagonal. Well, uh, this is the condition that DJ Krishna has in his book in, about ascending auctions as a necessary condition, a necessary or sufficient condition for equilibrium in uh, ascending auctions. So it's one that's been seen before. Um, and the proposition here is that average costing implies that the uh, price function in the in the rational expectation rational expectations equilibrium is totally monotone. So here that formula is displayed. Now in the limit auction, we're going to look at it. Um, we'll be, we will be studying it with a total monotonicity condition. So we look at here in this first displayed equation that the we look at this measure of those people uh, who are bidding less than uh, that B, 
And those are the ones that we want that many to be equal to uh, uh, this M naught, which is the number that have to be unserved in the market. Well, so um, if we look at the largest price, that's what this row infinity is. The infinity always means here, we're looking at the infinite uh, economy. We look at the largest ones such that, that the unserved ones less than, than M naught. So that gives us a price function. It's just the highest one. It says that we get the right number of people uh, unserved. So then from that, we infer the probability of trading, which is uh, down here, the tau, and the price function. And then of course you get payoffs here. Whoop, excuse me. Then you get the payoff it's done in the same way as we had before for the finite auction. We have the probability of trade, which is the tau infinity, and that's multiplied times the gain between the value and the price. And we're going to say that this uh, limit auction outcome is non-trivial if there's some probability of trading that's not constant, for, you know, it's for somebody in some circumstance. So um, that's to say we, we don't have one of these things where all the buyers bid zero and all the sellers bid uh, ask ask uh, exorbitant price and there's no trade. So uh, that would be, you have a constant trading probability then. But what we're gonna do, you know, we exclude that when we talk about a non-trivial outcome. So now this uh, existence and uniqueness of this Nash equilibrium in the infinite economy is done, you have to extend the manifold, which I, I'm not gonna emphasize the notation, but at the two endpoints, you can have, you know, demand is not exactly, uh, is, is, you cannot have the market clear exactly at the two endpoints. So it extends the manifold, and then you get this property that the, if the, uh, this, uh, well, raising price is um, mon totally monotone, both in its, so it and its cutoffs are increasing in, in the state. Then this uh, sigma that we were working about, the, equilibrium, the strategies in the auction provides a non-trivial equilibrium of, of the auction, gamma infinity, and that and the clearing price you get is exactly the Valrhesian price. And uh, average crossing, uh, if you assume that, which is a little stronger, it's essentially the unique monotone non-trivial e equilibrium, essentially because any other one generates the same clearing prices. Uh, and I'm going to skip these uh, ideas of the proof. Um, time's running long. So, so, and then there's a point here that Absent the um, the strong monotonicity, we have in this example that there's no equilibrium at all. Okay, so this it's not a question of whether there's uh, some other equilibrium that there cannot be an equilibrium of that uh, close. So, um, and in this here, the example depends upon this parameter, but the parameter the the Smaller the parameter, the bigger the number of participants there have to be. And so it's just a, you know, a cat chasing its tail. Okay, and the first, uh, the technical result that um, first of all is that if you have a sequence now, which with total amount of diversity, you'll have such a sequence of equilibria in the auctions as the number of replicates of the traders increases that's monotone, non-trivial, point-wise limit, then that would be an equilibrium in the infinite economy. And there's a uh, strong law of large numbers that in fact, that clearing price is converging to the uh, equilibrium clearing price. Um, well, I mean, you know, equi the clearing price in the, from the finite auctions is converging to this clearing price point-wise um, in the uh, infinite economy. And this, this property 
here, it's mentioned here, it's going to imply that the distribution of the auction price is reconverging to the to the uh, a point mass at the infinite economy for each for each state. Okay, and then with uniform convergence, uh, there are further technical uh, properties. One is that the convergence uh, of the distribution of prices is uniform across the states. And a, and a really nicely nailed down central limit theorem that uh, if, for this statement, the way it's stated here is if, if the rate of convergence is uh, of uh, order little o of, of one over the square root of n. And, and we're talking about this uh, strictly differentiable in monotone limit. Then these uh, normalized prices are converging weak star to the normal distribution, of course, with mean zero, but the important, <laughs> they nail down exactly what the variance will be. And that variance is given here down below at the bottom by these two formulas, um, which uh, could deserve some commentary, but with the time, lim time uh, available, I'm going to move on. The lower sum of continuity is done like in um, uh, uh, Rennie and Zamir and uh, Rennie and Perry, namely with a finite grid. So there's a finite grid of uh, possible bids, and uh, we're going to get an epsilon equilibrium by allowing. Uh, uh, that grid, that grid size to play the role of epsilon. So again, total monotonicity is assumed, and um, within we have this uh, grid interval delta. So that you know characterizes uh, all of these ones that are lined up in the in the space of possible bids. And the point is that for for each sufficiently small grid size, there exists a number of traders in the economy large enough so that the corresponding game is an, has an equilibrium. And if uh, as these go to zero and infinity respectively, so you have the, as delta is going to zero, then N has to be bigger than the, the capital N of delta. Uh, and so they're going off to zero and infinity. Then the equilibrium price distributions uh, it converges weak star to the to the limit. So this is I mentioned here. They, there's also a central limit theorem for these equilibrium that will give a distribution of uh, prices for finite economies approaching the limit. So um, again, I'm skipping the proof. Except I want to emphasize this one point. There's a beautiful application here of degree theory to do this because you set up the first order conditions here with a finite grid size, it's more like instead of a differential equation, it's more like a difference equation system. And it's showing that there's a homotopy from the, um, the case in which uh, people just, uh, the bids equal to their value. Uh, and so they're all indifferent or, well, okay. I'm not expressing that very well, but so we look at the limit case as to how they would behave in the limit economy, and we look at the homotopy uh, and showing that there that there is such a one, and then you just the fact that there's a unique zero at the limit economy is actually telling you that then in a neighborhood there will be a zero for these perturbed systems that you get by using the the uh, positive grid size. So this is a, a technical uh, aspect. We actually, Hari worked very hard on doing this in terms of uh, with differential equations and looking at a, uh, assuming that everything's analytic and getting all, but it turns out that the whole problem is with, whether or not you can have compactness of the, of this in the system. So, um, but the key point here is that the equilibrium you get with delta, I'm looking at this first bullet point at the bottom, 
that that's an, e an epsilon equilibrium where you're just taking epsilon equal to the delta. And so it's an exact equilibrium. So it's uh, for these restricted space of strategies. And the, um, there's a note here that this is all for monotone pure strategies. It's not for mixed strategies. Okay, so um, the point is that one obtains now a sufficient condition for existence uh, with asymmetries. So this is, um, you know, we had existence with asymmetries for first price auctions in Rennie and Zamir. And now this is for double auctions with asymmetries, a, you know, a finite set that are then replicated and having the asymptotic product properties uh, converging to the rational expectations equilibrium. To some extent, it provides a foundation for auctions uh, uh, as a mechanism for realizing the rational expectations equilibrium or approaching it in the limit. Uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, the bad news here is the strong condition. That well, it's one thing to sort of discover these classes of even ordinary auctions, not even double auctions like in Akerlof, but just ordinary auctions that uh, don't satisfy strong monotonicity or average crossing, because that won't suffice. Um, we point out here at the last point that the because of that uh, strong law of large numbers effect, and such uh, that actually the rational expectation thing in the limit is implementable as a direct revelation game. So you might think that that tells you that some mechanism will work for a finite economy to get um, some, uh, you know, an implementation in, by some mechanism. Um, so I've had conversations with Paul Milgram about this. And his, his belief is that some sort of dynamic system, some of you might know the Gloucester Milgram work, where you, you have the, the price, there's always a bid and ask price, so that if a bid, if a bid price is accepted, it's uh, you're conditioning the prices, the bid, the S price and the bid price are each conditioned on the information revealed by the acceptance of that price. And so they have this view that if you operate the economy dynamically, that this will give you a rational expectations equilibrium. But that's in a, in a very much more elaborate dynamical system as a um, uh, an interesting kind of implementation that's sort of akin to an auction sort of the way a specialist would run a market by quoting bid and ask prices. Uh, but here we just look at static auctions. Uh, you could ask if there was something like an ascending auction, you know, dynamic in the an auction, but a dynamic auction in that sense. Um, and uh, it's probably not the case because uh, Krishna's average crossing condition is uh, uh, necessary to get an efficient outcome and rational expectations equilibria are presumably efficient as being of all raising outcomes. So you can't do it that way. Um, but, the, but the dynamics uh, that, that Milgram uh, uh, proposes uh, might work. Uh, but that's one in which price, it's like Volrazian in the sense that each time the market maker is quoting a price and he quotes that price, uh, a bid and ask price that are different in order to uh, incorporate the information revealed by the acceptance of the price. Okay, so that's it. Uh, I'll conclude. Um, so we can have some little discussion or questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Bob, for this excellent talk. Um, I think we should probably um, give the audience um, a, uh, the possibility to um, submit questions. Um, otherwise, I let me close my door.
Maybe I can start then. Um, one question I was wondering is, in the limit case, um, there is in some sense no uncertainty about the number of participants. And so if you think about large market, you would think randomness in terms of the number of participants is perhaps a, a critical part to understand. Um, I'm wondering whether my reading or my interpretation is correct and whether you've thought about that. Um, well, I'm pretty sure we haven't thought about it. <laughs> the, uh, there's no, in the model, there's no randomness here. There's a, a, a known set of agents for each mm -hmm. and we know the number of agents of each type and even at the limit with the same thing that there's not, there's no uh, randomness. Now, it's true that if you had some sort of a random selection, then that means in each particular realization of the market, you're only getting a, a subset of the signals represented in the bidding behavior. So I guess you wouldn't really get rational expectations because you wouldn't be including the implications of all of the signals because some of those signals are not represented by bids from the traders that have them. Could I, could I say something? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the limit, the equilibrium of the limit model is an epsilon equilibrium for all large options. So it's like a uniform epsilon equilibrium. So even if you had an unknown number of agents, there would be epsilon equilibrium. Mm -hmm. That would be mm -hmm. robust to this. Good point. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, and, Pradeep? Yeah, well, uh, you finish first. I have a question. No, I, I was going to say I can see um, that some participants have raised their hands and would like to pose a question. So maybe we allow one or two questions and then Pradeep, you can ask a question. Okay, well, I'd like uh, Bob or and Hari to expand on the third point in the good news the multiple commodities, you know, this brings us closer to the classical arrow de Bro model, but things like uniqueness, et cetera, are hard to imagine. Well, it's, let me say right off, it's very clear that like in those models, you'd have to have make some assumptions about substitution or complementary, you know, ex probably right. excluding complementarities and so on. Mm -hmm. So um, any generalization would have to ha impose rather strict structure. Mm -hmm. Um, there are uh, more problems of multiple equilibria with uh, multiple commodity, or excuse me, a multidimensional signals. Uh, Hoyman, the work of uh, Hoyman has been showing this, that even in the simplest models that we have, when you have multidimensional signals, instead of one dimensional, then you generate new equilibria. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's a really, <laughs> And when you say might, techniques might generalize, that's a very big might. There's <laughs> a big question as to whether you could carry it through. Um, the, uh, but say if you have uh, everything or substitutes, uh, like the golan Pessendorfer and golan Stichetti, they have these really nice models, everything's submodular and uh, really quite regular. I mean, one could conceive of that possibility. Yeah, I don't think I don't think uniqueness is something that you could get, even though we are in a monotone environment. Yeah. But as long as things are locally unique, right. as long as the equilibria are locally unique, mm -hmm. if you, there are existence issues, even there, you would need some analog of total monotonicity. But assuming you have something like that, mm -hmm. you could still have local uniqueness, which is all you would need to carry this through. Kenneth mm -hmm. yeah. Nouns um, would like to pose a question from the audience, so I just um, gave him the chance to um, ask his question. Kenneth? I'm not hearing you. Yeah, go ahead. Kenneth, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, that doesn't seem to work. Um, in which yeah. case... Yeah. Hmm. Is, 
it might be better for Kenneth um, if you could pose your question to chat, then uh, maybe we have less of an audio issue. Um. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience or from, from the panelists who have joined us this afternoon? Let's see, if I may add uh, one thing, Bob, um, which you mentioned right at the end, the, the um, thinking of Paul Milgram's idea of the bid-ask spread and the, some dynamic system, then one other thought on that is, um, I mean, you have this bid ask spread because of the adverse selection that is reflected in the price. Um, so the, the buy and the sell have to be uh, distinct. But as the quantity traded falls to zero, that spread also shrinks to zero. So you can imagine um, that uh, if, um, if quantity and quantity can be made continuous, and can therefore go to zero. If you're trading frequently enough, um, then that bid ask spread would would vanish. Yeah, but somehow <laughs> it's a um, this whole thing of having two different prices and how you see so the way they have it is that the profits of the of the uh, the specialist who's holding the bid and ask their expected profits are zero. But we would have here all those realizations of uh, profits in the, along the way for, that would produce a uh, not exact market clearing. So somehow you're getting a system where there's profits for the um, for the market operator, uh, potentially profits for losses, which an expectation are going to be zero. But in the limit, you're getting something different where there's uh, that role of separation of between bid and S prices disappears. So I, I see your point that as you make the trading continuous and so on, you would it conceivably in the limit, it's going to look like a one price system instead of a two price system. <laughs> 